excited to get to share this word with you guys. I've been working, all, working on it all week, and I'm ready. I hope you're ready, too. So, the Christmas season is finally upon us. We were greeted with a nice storm of fresh, fluffy snow, and then ice on the pavement this morning, making us almost slip and fall and break our ribs and back. I almost did that. Um, very clumsy. Um, but it's a time where we get to celebrate Christ's birth, and we get to tell each other Merry Christmas, because this is the day that, D- that Jesus came to earth for us. But imagine with me real quick that you wake up on Christmas morning, and if you have kids, your kids run into the bedroom to start opening their gifts, and they, and they greet you with, Happy Federal Holiday. <laughs> what? Oh, guys, look, the, the, the federal holiday cookies are all ready for us. The federal holiday choir, they did a great job, didn't they? They just did a really good job singing those federal holiday songs. It sounds ridiculous, right? But this, was, this greeting of happy federal holiday was actually proposed by a professor from the University of Central Florida. And she stated in this opinion piece that all Christmas greetings in America should, should change to this because of the different religions that are being brought into America and, and the melting pot that it's b- created to become. Um, we need to get rid of Merry Christmas and even Happy Holidays because we are putting our major holiday, we're forcing it upon other people that don't even consider it really a holiday. She says in her piece, in our efforts to be inclusive, we show cultural insensitivity both by equating one major holiday with a minor holiday and failing to recognize that diversity includes those who celebrate neither holiday. And then she lays out her claim of happy federal holiday should be used for the entire Christmas season um, and it just becomes equated with Columbus Day or Washington's birthday. But for us, Christmas holds such a more significant meaning, right? And we come to this, we come to this holiday prepared to say Merry Christmas because we know what this Christmas holiday is about. And, but the thing is, there is a cultural push that is happening where people are always faced with Jesus when they come to this Christmas holiday. They're faced with with the birth of Jesus and what he did for us, and they're faced with this, and they don't want to face it directly, so they try and take everything out of it. But it's Christmas, right? And we can say Merry Christmas, and we can celebrate Christmas the best that we can by saying Merry Christmas, having Christmas cookies, and having a Christmas choir. And it becomes this cultural push brings us the war on Christmas. How many of you guys have heard of the war on Christmas? Some of us, a few of us. It feels like Christmas is being attacked almost from this, from this one side. And, and we go onto news websites that have aggregated all these different articles about how Christmas is being attacked by, a, by, um, by this side that doesn't want to face Christmas. And we begin to have this feeling that we need to maintain our freedom of speech by being able to say Merry Christmas. And that we need to have a time, we need to have people say Merry Christmas no matter what they believe, because there's a significance to it. We wear a badge of honor for being able to say Merry Christmas. And we don't want secularism to come and steal that away from us. We celebrate Christmas by being able to say Merry Christmas like it's a Super Bowl. And Christmas brings these two clashing ideologies together. Like, ta- like football tacklers in, in the Super Bowl, we just clash with, with each other. And we keep clashing and clashing, and these, and these ideologies keep clashing with one another on this topic for that is happening all the time, but Christmas brings it out even more. And when this this conflict happens, us as Christians, we can take it two kinds of ways. We can begin to shy away from it a little bit, 
We can shy away and and put our heads down and hunker down when we feel that the war on Christmas is starting. And we don't want to even interact with anybody because of that. But today, it's time for the, if we shy away, it's time for you to think, is this an opportunity, this Christmas season, that Jesus is giving me not to defend Christmas, but to show Jesus' love? And for those that think that they need to defend Christmas, they need to, everyone should say Merry Christmas. Is it time for us to to change our way of thinking? And instead of focusing on what people should say, instead we should be thinking, what would Jesus want me to say? What would Jesus want me to show to this person that is in conflict with what Jesus did for them. Christmas is a time of convergence. Again, these two two ideologies clashing with one another, it forces us to face these ideas with one another. And when these, two, uh, when these two ideas converge with one, another, with one another, it's like an explosion of conversation. And so many times, it doesn't end up in love, but it ends up in hurtful speech and hurtful things being said to one another to the point where we have lost Jesus' love when those conversations come up. By the end of that, by the end of that conversation, we kind of end up with... Kind of like this, if you take a look at the video. Alphabetically. Odd Barkian, Apocanesia who? I hate you! That would be Benson who? I hate you! Hate, 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 hate. Double hate. Loathe entirely. We can kind of end up like that. Maybe not to that extent like Jim Carrey always is, but we can begin to get a heart of, of, of hate instead of love. And it's almost like these, Christmas is a time where we're inviting these two, these two groups to come together at a dinner table. And at the head of the table is Jesus, the one who invites everybody to his table, the one who invites everybody to his presence to experience the love that he gave each and every person on this world. And then it's almost like there's a food fight happening. And I just picture Jesus at the head of the table, distraught, tears coming down his face, because both sides are missing the point. Jesus coming to earth is the greatest action of love that has ever been done on this earth by any human on this planet. And this unconditional love is stretched to each and every one of his followers. This unconditional love is stretched to each and every person in this world. And as his followers, he expects us to show that same exact love to each and every person in this world as well. Honestly, as Christians, we should see this time of year kind of like Jesus giving us an opportunity. Half the work is done for us. People that don't believe in Jesus are forced to face Jesus during this Christmas season. It surrounds them completely. They go shopping in a mall. They're going to hear a Christmas carol about Jesus, and they're going to have to think about it. Who's going to be there to help them understand what those Christmas carols mean. What it means that Jesus came into this world to save them from their sins. What are we going to do about that opportunity that we get? Before we take any action steps, I think it's a good time to start examining this, this, this love that we see from Jesus when he, he was born, when he came to earth this Christmas season, and how this affects us as believers and what we're supposed to truly be like, not just during the Christmas season, but for our entire lives. Will you join me in prayer as we begin to look at the scriptures with one another? 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this time that we can study your word and study who you are and study who you want us to be in this world. Lord, I thank you for your son that came to this earth. I thank you that he brought a love that is beyond all understanding, but that you want us to stretch this love out to everyone that we meet. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit will will work in our hearts and that we will be changed forever by this message that um, you, your Holy Spirit is sharing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're going to be looking at Matthew's version of Jesus' birth, the, um, the gospel of Matthew. And a lot of this gospel, throughout the, the entire thing, throughout this gospel, Matthew pops in different passages from the Old Testament. And the point of Matthew doing this is he was writing to, to mainly a Jewish audience And he was wanting to prove to them that Jesus truly was their Messiah and how he fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecy that had taken place um, in the Old Testament. He He had fulfilled that prophecy during his time on earth, pointing out that he was truly the Messiah. And now let's take a look at what Matthew writes in his first chapter. Um, Let's look at chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Matthew references a few Old Testament passages in verse 23. And we're just going to look at one of those passages that he references. And it takes place in Isaiah 9, actually, the verse that Pastor talked about um, when he came up to pray. And we're going to dive into this a little more. um, Because when we look at this reference, to get a better understanding of what Matthew is trying to tell us in his first chapter, when he just brings out that portion of Scripture, we get a better idea of it when we look at the entire chapter that he references. So if you want to turn with me real quick to Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6. And it says, Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled. But there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery, and lift the heavy burdens from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms, bloodstained by war, will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Matthew is bringing us to this part of Isaiah to show us that this passage is being fulfilled through the birth of Jesus. God's love invaded the darkness through the birth of Jesus and changed the world forever. And when we look at verses 2 through 5, this is the effect of Jesus' birth. This is what happened when Jesus came to this earth and when he lived his life and died on the cross. We see God hates his people oppressed by the darkness. He never wanted them to live in it, ever. This darkness brings nothing but terrible things, and there was nothing Israel could do about it or do to make it undone. But God always had a plan. He always had a plan. 
And sometimes when we think of a plan, we can start to think of God giving us the tools to be able to make this plan happen, to make it come into fruition. But God didn't give us tools for us to do all the work. He didn't expect us to do anything. Because humanity, we caused this darkness when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. We put ourselves into this mess that we find ourselves in, this this darkness of sin. And sometimes we can expect God wanting us to do all the work. But God loved us so much that he sent his son for us instead to do all the work for us. And that's his plan. That was his plan all along. In verse 6, For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. This child that's born to us, Jesus, he gives us these gifts that are listed in Isaiah. We take part in living with Christ and he gives us light into our life. And then rather than us living in darkness, we become part of the family of God through Jesus, becoming grafted into his family the way he wants us to live. We get to experience being in the presence of God, being in the presence of God's family and him being our heavenly father. We are given the keys to freedom away from the slavery of sin. He's the one who fought for our freedom, and we get to live in it. And in verse 5, this is is amazing, because in verse 5, it shows us that we can throw away everything that we've been trying to do for ourselves. All the equipment that we use to, to fight against the darkness, all that we were trying to do, all that we have tried to pursue and, and, and fight against, the, this, this darkness that is inside of us, everything that we, all the armor that we've put on, we can throw it away. We can burn it because Jesus fought and won the victory for us already. That's amazing to think about. This whole time that we've been fighting, this whole time that we've been trying to do it on our own, God lifted the burden for us through his son. And today, if you're in here and you feel like you've been fighting your entire life, let this verse speak to you. Let this verse sit in your heart. Because you don't have to fight anymore. Jesus already fought for you. He's fought our battles and he defeated the enemy. He defeated the darkness and all of it can be burned away and be forgotten because Jesus won the battle and he's the one that fights for us. This is the gift that we see in Matthew. This is the child that was sent to earth. It's the light that will erase all darkness. And when we read that passage in Isaiah, we see the unconditional love that God has for each and every one of us. It's unconditional because we don't have to do anything for this gift. God loves us so much that we don't have to lift a finger and that he would send his son to be the sacrifice for us. We are completely free from sin without even lifting a a finger. This is what we're supposed to pull from this Old Old Testament text. This is the moment we've been waiting for. This is the gift that the world has been waiting to open up, to finally have the light destroy the darkness. But sometimes even when we open a gift of true love, we can open it and kind of become reluctant to accept it. And that sounds a little crazy, right? That sounds a a little unorthodox for us to to open this gift of of true love and, and and. acceptance into God's family that, of course, we would accept it, right? But Tim Keller lays this out in his book, uh, Hidden Christmas, and, and 
he lays out how we can sometimes become reluctant of the gift of love that God has for us. He writes, some gifts by their very nature make you swallow your pride. Imagine opening a present on Christmas morning from a friend, and it's a dieting book. You take off another ribbon and wrapper, and you find it is another book from another friend, and it's called Overcoming Selfishness. Here's the thing. If you say to them, thank you so much, you are in a sense admitting, for indeed I am fat and obnoxious. (laughs) You see, sometimes we can be faced with this gift that God's given us, this this incredible gift of love, uh, this incredible gift of, of Jesus Christ, God's Son, and we see it, and the only thing that screams through our mind is you're not good enough. And as humans, we're trained to fight that thought. If you go for a job interview and you get declined that job and they give you the reasons why, most of the time you're going to go and you're going to try and fix these things on your own because you were taught as a child, keep going, keep fighting for it. You can do it. You can make it. That's still being said to, to teenagers. If they, if they fail at a, at, at a sports team, keep going, keep trying, keep practicing because you can overcome it. You can overcome But when we're faced with the gift of Jesus, it's worse than being called fat or obnoxious. You get to see that you're sinful. And then the step becomes whether we admit that or not. You see, Jesus loves us so much that he doesn't want us to walk in this sinful life anymore. But being prideful, we can say we don't need God's gift because we can do it on our own. And we continue to fight and we continue to try and overcome, but when you try and fight and when you try and work in darkness, you can't see what you're working on. When you continue to to try and work um, with the bondages of sin in your life, you can't get anything done because you're bound. Christmas brings us to this realization and people shy away from it and they'll try and get away from it as much as possible by naming Christmas a federal holiday. But they need to know God's love during this time and see, even though they can't do anything about it, God's love is there and God loves them and he cares for them. And he wants to set them free. You see, that brings us to when we accept Jesus and accept this gift of love, now he sends us out to project his love onto the world. God's gift of Jesus coming to earth is a reminder for his love that cannot be compared to anybody else. With such a loving gift, our lifestyles cannot help but be different now. It changes us, and we aren't supposed to keep it to ourselves. When Jesus grew up and started his ministry, he told us that we were supposed to be light to the world. In Matthew Verse, uh, chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, he says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Jesus is the one who illuminates our lives. He shows us who we truly are without him as our Savior. Without him, we're covered in sin. But remember, because of him, we're made clean forever. And now that we've received this light, he's called us to be his light in the world. 
This call by Christ is to be taken seriously by every person who knows Christ as their Savior. We are his followers, his disciples. And we're meant to show the world the ways of the one that we follow. The one who lit our lives up to reveal who we really are. We spread the light by living the way Jesus commands us. And we show this way by showing how much greater this life really is. People that are still living in darkness, not truly knowing the true way of life, the way that God meant life to be, need to see it through us now. Need to see it in the way that we act, in the way that we converse, in the way that we show love to them, even though they don't agree with what we believe. Because when they see the light, truly see it, they'll want it. They don't want to live in darkness anymore. And the way of Jesus is full of light. In order to fully live out this way of life, we don't just need to know what Jesus talks about. We just don't need to know what he tells us to do. We need to live it out. We need to live it out for people to see. Leaving out this, light, this, this lifestyle means that we must put our past lives behind us, put our pride behind us, put our anger behind us. We don't live for ourselves anymore. We live for Jesus. And we need to do everything we can to distribute God's love as much as possible. But being human, we can sometimes slip away from that mission, that purpose of sharing the light of Jesus for everyone to see. Because we, we can become prideful and, and want to share our own opinions and share our own thoughts on things. And we do exactly what Jesus tells us would be the craziest thing for us to do. We cover our light. It kind of reminds me of, um, I've heard people that don't usually swear. And when they, when they do swear, they say, pardon my French. Or, uh, excuse my language for a second, but... Mm. They're, they're covering their their goodness, per se. But when we act out in ourselves, it's like, excuse me, God, while I cover my light for a second, because I really got to say this one thing. Sorry, God, I'm just going to, I'm just one second, let me just cover it up, and then I'll, I'll bring it back, you know? It won't change anything, really. You see, when Jesus talks about light in that passage, it's interesting to me because now we have LED lights. We have all these different lights that really are super bright and even lights that can, can really blind you. Like we had the spotlight at the kids' play and people were shining it in people's eyes. I don't know why. <laughs> but like, I'm going to go blind if you keep doing that. We have super bright lights now. But back then, they had like candles. And when, you really, when the electric goes out and you start lighting your candles, you realize... There's not a lot of light coming from a candle. They needed their light more than anything. They needed that candle light because they couldn't see anything. And even though it was dim, they, they needed it so badly. And to cover it up would be incredibly stupid. This is what Jesus is talking about. Don't cover up your light by stating your own opinion, by, by being angry with other people. Let your light shine God's love and live by that light all the days of your life. This kind of came up to me a few weeks back. This, this whole idea kind of was like a, a freight train coming in front of me. Because I, I'm on Twitter, and apparently Twitter is the place where everyone states their opinions all the time, whether they're right or wrong, whatever. And every time I would get on Twitter, every time I would read different tweets, 
I would get so angry. Because people are just saying the most outlandish things. They're, they're, they're showing things that are just completely irresponsible and, and silly. And, and news places are not fact-checking and things like that. And I am just, oh my gosh. And when I would get off Twitter, that anger would stay. And I didn't really realize it at the time, but... I felt like God was telling me, you got to get rid of that. You have to get rid of that anger. And here's the source. Because when I would leave the house after being on social media, after being on Twitter, when I would leave, I wasn't shining God's light. I would be contemplating how how I would respond to a certain comment or things like that. I would be contemplating about that. I would be focusing so much on something that was making me angry that it was spreading out to other people around me. We have things in our lives that are kind of bringing us away from God's love. We have things in our lives that we are making cover up our light all the time. And God is speaking to you daily. It's time to get rid of that. It's time to take a break from that. And focus on my love. Because when we focus on his love, it pours out of us. A good example of being focused on other things is the Corinthian church. They were going through some rough patches in their church and they started focusing on themselves more than loving others around them. They started focusing on spiritual gifts more than God's love. They started focusing on class systems where the rich would have a better seat at the Lord's Supper rather than the poor. They were not focused on love, but on status. And Paul brings this up in 1 Corinthians Corinthians 13. It says, If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Paul's telling the Corinthians that they can work through all these spiritual gifts and show such a great spiritual knowledge and, and be a part of a higher class of, of spirituality and things like that. But it doesn't matter when we cover up the light, when we cover up God's love in our lives. And the word love here Paul is using, it's, it's agape love, which means a community of love. In a community, they take care of one another, right? In a community, you, you, you're watching out for your brother and sister. You're, you're there for them when they need something all the time. And they weren't showing that type of love. Jesus is calling us to that type of love when he came to earth. Because he saw this, his world, his community that he created. He said, I need to fix this. He sent his son for us. You see, there's so much going on in the world that can cause us to become quarrelsome. People that we don't agree with, things not going our way. And we have a choice when we're presented with these things. Are we going to show the love of God? Or are we going to show what we think matters? If we choose what we think matters, then we're in the same boat as the Corinthian church. We've lost sight of God's love. And we need to refocus ourselves. But when we show God's love, people realize something is different. And the more we show it, the more people want to go into understanding, a deeper understanding of where that love comes from and what it's all about. It may not be instantaneous, 
And that's why we need to continue to show that love all the time. We can't become sidetracked like the Corinthians did. We can't cover our, lot, our light with our, with our opinions. When we become followers of Jesus, we must stay focused on spreading his love for every single moment of the rest of our lives. If I could have someone come up and, and start playing some music for us as we get into a time of, of introspection. And I brought up at the beginning of the sermon the table where God has invited everyone to this day, table during this Christmas season. And we have the two groups with separated values. We, one that wants nothing to do with Christianity, one that wants nothing to do with Christ to the point where they want to remove him even from the name Christmas. And we have the group that wants to fight for that right to have Jesus back in Christmas. And remember, it's Christmas time that forces these two ideas to come together. But when we bring those two ideas, we lose the focus the purpose of Christmas. For God sent his son to be the light that defeats darkness. The son who brought every person the opportunity to join the family of God. The son who was victorious over all of our enemies over the enemy so that we could be free from bondage of sin. The son who said, you can throw away all of your armor. You can throw away all that you've been trying to do because I've done it for you. And so this morning, if you've been fighting, if you've been trying your hardest to to live a life that is good, that is, that is pleasing to others, but you don't know Christ. This morning, I want to pray with you that you can experience true freedom through the gift of God's love. And if you, have, if you do know Christ, God wants to meet with you at these altars today. Because there is, this is a time where we refocus our hearts on what truly matters this Christmas season. On the love of God. And that we share that, not just during Christmas, but our entire lives. Because that is our call as a Christian. That is our call as a follower of Jesus. Shine your light. Don't ever cover it up. Don't let your opinions get in the way. Don't let your spiritual gifts in the way like the Corinthians did. Don't let anything get in the way of that light. Because there are people that are out there that need to see it. Who have been in darkness for so long. Who have been fighting this gift. We need to shine that light. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for your love to us. We thank you for the love that you have shined upon this entire world when your son came to this earth. Lord, we celebrate you this Christmas season as the one who set us free, as the one who gave us the gifts of freedom, of love, true love, the one who paid the price for our sin. God, I ask that our hearts will be refocused today, Lord God, and that your Holy Spirit will speak to each and every one of us as we seek after you. In Jesus' name, amen.